there we go. So welcome everyone. Um, today we've got Jason uh, Sati from Devson and Coding Ground. Um, he's going to be talking about the trends in software. But before we go into Jason's piece, I just wanted to introduce most of you do, I mean, when I was looking at who's online, um, most of you do know Techways. Um, so I'm not going to go into the whole like who was Techways uh, information. But I did want to give you guys a little sneak preview into some of the things that are coming up, like some of our new courses. Um, and, and, and also, let me first say that I don't know if you can hear in my voice, but I'm recovering from pneumonia. So if I do have like a coughing uh, like episode, I'm going to mute myself and just um, hopefully, Jason, you can just cut in then. But uh, hopefully it doesn't happen too often. So um, it, just, just putting it out there. Um, so for those of you that attended our last Future Skills session, we had it with Sherry Don Donaldson from the BRICS Future Skills group. And she was telling us all about some of the amazing future jobs that are coming online. Some of them are already online, but she, she was kind of her and the BRICS group. They sort of predict into the future what that's going to look like. Um, for those that missed that, it is available on our events page um, under past events on, uh, on our website. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today really was, I'm not going to go into our vision and all of that. What I wanted to focus on was the new courses, and then we'll go into the software trends um, from Jason. There will be a chance for Q&A throughout. Um, you guys are welcome to interrupt us as we go along. This is not a formal presentation. So, um, but then we will also have a chance at the end for more Q&A um, afterwards. So I'm not going to go through the video um, or that or that. So our new courses have, for those of you that are learners on the uh, pathway, you might have already noticed that you've got access to the cybersecurity pathway, the data science pathway, and the web back in development pathway. Um, if you want, just go look on the Techways Online um, website to, to get a sense of what all of those courses are and what, what's coming. But the first one is cybersecurity, where we've built a Linux Essentials course for you. Um, the project that you're doing is it's like a little AI sorting machine. Um, and I actually wanted to take you to see the sneak preview of what it looks like. Um, because you are, look at this, humans are, you guys will notice the learners that are on my platform, we love stories and we love telling stories. So this story is about humans living on Sparta, which is a planet that doesn't exist, um, or it may exist, but we don't know about it yet. Um, and we're on the brink of extinction. And these robots have basically eaten up our Earth's biomass. And you guys are having to rebuild that biomass by creating, taking images of, so, so the, bit of, the bit of technology that doesn't exist that we are sort of uh, hoping one day will exist is and the ability to take an image. <laughs> Jason, you'll tell us whether this is possible. Take an image and um, figure out the DNA of that plant. Like let's say it's an image of, millies you know it figures out the dna of that milli and then it regenerates that milli and the same with an animal it shows a picture of the cow and then it regenerates <laughs> the cow and that's how you guys are going to be essentially recreating all the earth's biomass um for for the earth yeah so that's that's the linux um course just a little uh, sneak preview then on the data science pathway, we, we actually don't have the Excel course ready yet. Um, our, the developer that was working on that, he got COVID and so we, we had to sort of delay that timeline. So we've actually released the Power BI course before um, Excel. Normally you have to do the one before the other. Um, and this one is a really great course where you, um, the story, I'm not gonna go into it, uh, in depth, but the storyline is also kind of ap apocalyptic in a way. 
um, and you are trying to figure out the crime stats in, in this new futuristic world, and you're having to use data to, to figure out where the crime is happening, how to stop it, et cetera, et cetera. And so you're building a data model around that. And it's, it's a Power BI, it's a, it's a behemoth of a course. It's a, it's a very, very meaty course. We're actually thinking of splitting it into two because it's that. But this course is, um, if you're wanting to do anything in data science, like you're going to need to know either the software Power BI or one of its competitors because it's, it's crucial in, in to be able to like manipulate data. And then lastly, on the web development back end, we've um, released the PHP course where you are. This one is more about space. Um, What's, no, we don't have time. Um, so you're, you're essentially, you've lost a spaceship and we are now using, creating a program um, for a drone to go and locate that space, that um, spaceship. And you're using all the kind of programming concepts to, in order to do that. Some other cool stuff. Um, for those of you that are already on Discord, out of the learners on, on the group, um, it's a great way where you can share what you're doing, brag a little bit, and also quite a lot of learners are already like helping each other on there. It's a great, a, a great kind of community. Um, we've also got under our events, uh, under our student projects page, we've got a whole bunch of learners that we're starting to showcase what you guys are doing. So go and check that out. It's it's in beta, so don't. Um, it, it's gonna. You're gonna see it many, many iterations and improvements on that. But we're starting to just showcase what you guys are doing a little bit, and then coming, we're going to be starting to gamify more of our courses where you're getting points and ranks and prizes, etc. So that's it for me. Um, what I wanted to uh, just go back to this original slide is just. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to introduce Jason too much now because that's going to kind of steal the thunder of the, of the, uh, the presentation. I mean, but what I can tell you, Jason has been in tech for longer than most of you on the webinar so far have lived, definitely, like much longer. <laughs> um, I'm speaking to the learners, uh, not, not, well, not so much. Are you saying I'm old, uh, that's, is that what it is? Uh, in, a, <laughs> in a roundabout <laughs> way, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the young ones on the call, he's definitely been in tech for a long time. Um, the format of what's coming is that I'm going to, instead of Jason just presenting the whole time, um, I'm going to ask him some questions more in like an interview format. And you guys are also welcome to ask questions um, along the way. And yeah, so that's it. Anyone got anything you want to say before we kick start? Silence. I've got two chats. Hello, whoa. Okay, no, that's not, that, those were not, those were not chats meant for. Um, all right, so Jason, um, let me ask you some questions about, so that the audience can kind of get a sense of who you are a little bit. Um, you know, if, if you think back to your early years, when, when was it or what was it that caused you to first start getting interested in technology? Tell us a little bit more about that journey and how, how that uh, unfolded. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess um, I was lucky in my house because my, my dad at the time had a computer training business. So there were always computers lying around, which was great. Um, but actually where it all started was I wanted to play games lots of games. And if I could make my own games, I, you know, I'd be super excited. So I could really start it there around, you know, how could I make my own games? That would be a cool thing to do. Um, and so I think probably about, I think it's around about nine is where it really kind of bit me. And um, yeah, I think my parents battled to kind of drag me away from the computer. Um, I used to wake <laughs> them up quite early on a Saturday with uh, some of the really bad sound effects of an IBM PC, they hated it. <laughs> but as a kid, I mean, it was, it was for me like this, just a most, most amazing way to kind of like take your imagination and do something cool with it. Uh, so that's kind of where it started. 
And I'm sure a lot of the learners um, that we that we chatted to in the beginning online can relate to that because a lot of them are also interested in gaming and and some done some gaming. I think the uh, yeah the it, the lady from Evolve has done some uh, development as well, which is great. And I mean, I didn't intro you properly, just purposefully because I was going to ask you this question. Um, just give us a broad brushstroke of how your tech career went. And and guys, we are going to get to the software trends. I just want to sort of paint you a picture of, of Jason first, and then we're going to go into each of the software trends that Jason's outlining. So just tell us a little bit cool, more about your career. You. Sure, sure. I mean, um, maybe I'll just talk a bit about school. So school was really quite interesting. Um, I think it was about standard four when the teacher decided that I should run the class. So that happened. And then went through to matric and we were learning Turbo Pascal, which most people probably won't remember or don't know about, but it was a thing that we learned <laughs> in school. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I ended up running the classes quite a lot, but I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun, you know. So for me, I was very lucky. I, I knew from very young what I wanted to do, to do you know. Um, so I ended up studying engineering and um, I started out in telecommunications. So um, we, the very first job I got, I was uh, programming what are called line cards, which are these uh, kind of cards that the telecommunication guys use for various things. And it was quite low level stuff. It was really quite, quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I got some really nice experience out of that. Um, I guess in those days, I would kind of describe myself as the firefighter. So when things went wrong, I was like flowing around the world to go and sort out whatever problem there was, try and calm the customers down because they were usually jumping up and down by that point. Um, so that was fun, did that for a couple of years. Um, then I moved into kind of vehicle tracking and logistics and I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then, you know, I really, I made a decision consciously just to move into the world of what I call enterprise software, you know, because the, the line court stuff I was doing, there wasn't a lot of scope to kind of grow your career. So I wanted to get into the, the kind of mainstream stuff. Um, and then I, at that point, um, I was working in a company called Flextronics and, and we did uh, a whole bunch of things, you know, like the first internet banking for NetBank. Um, you know, quite a few iterations of that for other banks. Um, in, you know, we did a lot of uh, mobile applications. We did a lot of, um, you know, just normal web apps, uh, payroll systems, you know, all sorts of stuff. Wow. Anyway, so that was kind of like 10 years of consulting. And then, then I moved to RMB uh, sort of circa 2010. Um, I remember walking in there. My first job was, I think the chief operating officer came up to me and he said, Hi, nice to meet you. Let's go for a coffee. I'm like, oh, okay. They <laughs> said, um, we're going to lose our banking license. You need to fix it. We need to get our regulation, regulatory and statutory reporting sorted out. Otherwise, we're going to lose our banking license. Wow. Here's the team. Go forth and fix it. <laughs> which so which we do. man. Do. Yeah, there, there's a theme here. Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. I, I had a wonderful team and, and built a wonderful team. And, and within two years, we'd kind of sorted that out. Um, but yeah, in, in the time at the bank, I took care of development uh, for the bank and architecture after that. And then um, right at the end, uh, we, we, we did a lot of really cool things in the research and development uh, unit called Foundry, looking at crypto uh, sort of uh, currencies and, and where those are all going. Um, you know, digital platforms, machine learning, and, and a whole bunch of other cool things. Um, wow. But at, at a point, I, I decided, you know, the, the corporate career, I'd, I'd seen the movie and it was time to do something else. So um, I did that uh, right about March 2020, <laughs> which timing wise, you, you know, it was not the best time. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, since then, I've, I've been full time in, in the coding ground and devs and, and, and a few other things. And so, I mean, what, what's amazing about Coding Ground is that um, for those, of you, the, for the audience, Coding Ground is all about taking um, kids that have got zero exposure to programming, putting them into this amazing um, internship program and, you know, getting them access into jobs. Jason, tell us a little bit more about 
you, you know, the why, like how you started that and um, just how the program works? Sure. Yeah. So it's, uh, I remember it pretty clearly. It was about, it was 2017 and um, two guys that I, I, I was working with came into my office and they said, can we talk? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and they said, we believe it's our life purpose to do this work, to take guys and girls out of the townships and teach them how to become programmers and give them jobs. I said, sure. Okay. You had me at life purpose. Um, <laughs> what would you like? Um, some money, please, and some, some assistance. And, and so I gave both. But um, so that's kind of where it all started. But it, it's really about sort of job creation in the country and, and the passion that I have around technology and helping people to work in those uh, spaces. So, you know, we were kind of five plus years into this, you know, and we've created a lot of jobs already and we want to do more of this. Um, you know, there's such a demand in this country for technical skills. Um, and so we're sort of adding to the pool and, and uh, you know, I guess changing lives because um, it's the people that kind of need it the most, um, you know, in terms of our, our society. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of passion work. Um, and, you know, also I hire a lot of the graduates from Coding Ground into my own company. So ultimately everybody wins. It's a lovely ecological it's a nice uh, pipeline or, and you've got, and also, I mean, I, I don't know if we've got any um, parents uh, online uh, that have got, that work for companies, but I mean, this could also be an opportunity for your company to get access to an intern um, that a developer intern that's, uh, you know, that's come from nowhere and is, is going places. It's amazing. I mean, I've interacted with some of the coding ground guys. They really are phenomenal. Um, so, excellent. Um, if anyone does want to contact Jason on Coding Ground, um, I will just put it into the chat. It's Jason at Coding Ground. Is it The Coding Ground here, Jason? Yeah, The Coding Ground. The coding Ground. Yeah, we grounded, we grounded in our principles. And it's <laughs> the face. Yeah, I mean, lots of debates about the name, but we won't get into it uh, now. Cool. No, um, no, not, not the time. What I would like to, um, before we get into the, the software trends that you've outlined, um, just because we've got a mix of people on online with us and some are very young, some might not have a, 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 a full broad exposure into the concept of technology, like what technology actually entails. Um, just exactly. paint for us a picture when we talk about technology what are the pieces that that kind of bolt on or, or are part of that and how that then relates to the kinds of jobs that we have in technology? Sure. Um, so, so I think a lot of people think of technology as this sort of like big lump of stuff, um, but it's, it's made up of very distinct parts. So I'll kind of use my phone as the example. So I have here a, you know, a mobile phone. You guys all have one of these, I'm sure. And so what this is, is a piece of hardware, right? The term is hardware. So this is, uh, it has electronics and a battery and a whole bunch of circuitry inside. Um, and, and basically on this hardware runs uh, an operating system. So this is an Android phone. And on Android, we, we run the software that we write for it. Now, um, how this all kind of hangs together is, you know, these pieces of hardware and the software that runs on top they don't sit in isolation, they talk to each other. And the way that they talk to each other is through this, this idea of networking uh, and essentially, you know, through the, the you know, MTNs or Vodacoms or Celsius or whatever it is of the world, um, the networking allows the hardware and the software of different devices owned by different people around the world to talk to each other. And so there's a whole bunch of, of jobs in the world of kind of networking, software, hardware, um, and of course, cloud, which I'll get into just now. Um, uh, but basically, that's that's the kind of lay of the land uh, in a nutshell. Cool. Now that's helpful. Um, so Jason's going to. I mean, there's so many different software trends. Jason and I were having a chat yesterday to sort of talk through what all of them were, and there's 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 lots, obviously. But Jason has kind of picked three that he thinks are the most exciting. Um, and that he's seen is very like high high impact and high priority, and 
I'm actually going to hand it over now to Jason to sort of present how these trends are manifesting in the marketplace and what, how it's sort of going to play out into the future as well. Um, so a little bit of, of, of Jason's predictions, we'll, we'll see whether they come true or not. We will only know in like 10 years time, maybe even five. Um, and, and very important, all of them, we're going to look also at what types of skills you'll need for each of those trends. Um, and then, Jason, I'd just like to pause to have some questions. If um, I mean, we don't have a lot of people online uh, today, so we, we can have open mic. And, um, you know, if anyone wants to ask questions, we can pause after each trend. So I'm going to make you host. Sure. Um, Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to you... stop my video so I can concentrate on the presentation. Um, Okay. okay, you are now host. Thank you. All right, let me put this on. Okay. That is so weird. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, did it come through okay? Yeah. We'll see. Super. All right, guys. So, um, you know, as Joe said, um, please, you know, if you want to ask questions, we'll we'll have questions after kind of each trend, and we can, you know, really jump into whatever interests you. Um, no, all I need is the next slide. Cool. So, what I'll be covering today um, is really three key trends that I see. Um, talking about programming languages, cloud and serverless, and storage. And um, we'll go into each of these in terms of, you know, a, a bit of a reflection of, of kind of where we were a while ago and kind of where we are now. Um, you know, on the programming language side, um, we're actually in this place of exponential complexity. Um, where things used to be so much simpler, things have got a lot more complicated. But in the complexity is opportunity, and we'll, we'll talk through that. Um, I'll also talk a bit about uh, cloud and serverless. Now, the word cloud is just so widely used. You know, Everybody's talking about putting their data in cloud. They're talking about cloud this, cloud that. Um, but um, we'll talk a bit about, you know, what are some of the trends that are happening in, in cloud and this thing called serverless, which feels a bit uh, strange. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about uh, storage, uh, in particular the DNA storage technologies that have emerged. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about of those. And then at the end, I'll sum up just sort of the key takeaways around, you know, what does this all mean in terms of skills? Uh, what does this all mean about new jobs what you know? What is the disruption? Great. So let's talk about programming languages. So as Joe mentioned, I'm pretty old, right? So um, when I started my career uh, many years ago, um, there were probably three programming languages that that were like considered serious. That that you would really build, um, you know, proper enterprise-grade software in, and um, life was in those days simple from that perspective because, you know, there weren't lots of options and all you needed to do is know what you needed to build and off you would go and build, build that software. However, if we look at 2021, um, we are in a very different world. We have, you know, over 300 recognized languages and probably other languages that we don't know about. But we have what, what I call this sort of multiplier effect because it's not just the programming language. We now have combinations of libraries, platforms, um, and, you know, there's at least, you know, probably 100 or more combinations that you can use per language. Um, so we really have this sort of exponential complexity now and, and just it's almost like a menu at a restaurant with way too many choices. And that's kind of where we are at. So you're probably sitting there and you're probably saying, well, like, how did we get to this point? Like, what happened? Um, 
and my kind of opinion here and my view is really is that a lot of what we're seeing has been driven by the open source software movement. Um, because it's, it's a really strange thing where you've got people around the world who give their time freely for no money to build software um, for a cause. Um, but I think the, the key thing here um, around open source is it's people's interests and passions. And, and with all the people around the world, you know, the open source movement has grown massively. You know, companies like Red Hat, for example, their whole business model relies on open source uh, software going through the pipeline. And so, so it has definitely been a driver towards where we are at now. Um, and so I think this is, I think this is both a good thing, um, but also a challenging thing just in terms of all these choices and complexity. So if we look um, in 2021 and we look at where the programming languages are now, um, I, I just listed the top four. So we've got Python up there. Um, and Python, it's not new, but it's really popular because it's, um, it's actually quite simple to use. And it's used a lot in the data space, you know, um, data scientists uh, doing machine learning and other data engineering. Um, it's really just a, quite a friendly language from that perspective. Um, then we've got Java, and Java's been with us for a long time. Um, I think most large corporates around the world have some Java in their in their systems. Um, you know, it's the enterprise-grade um, tried and tested uh, language. Then we've got JavaScript. Now, um, you know, 20 years ago, JavaScript, if you said to somebody, I'm a JavaScript programmer, they'd look at you really strangely and say, that's not a language. Um, and in those, in those days, it wasn't. It was really hard to use and hard to debug and just messy. Um, but what has happened with Google um, spending so much money in investing in their sort of JavaScript implementation and Microsoft doing standards, JavaScript is now a first-class language with wonderful support, um, you know, from the back end to the front end. Um, and, and again, um, absolutely I must be on the list to know and master uh, as a programmer. Um, and then we've got C Sharp, which is, uh, I guess I'd call it Microsoft's response to Java. Um, but the language has is, is gone way further than Java has. Um, very powerful, uh, lovely language. Quite a, a funny story about this because um, back in the 80s and even into the early 90s, um, Microsoft were really their, their kind of software tools or programming tools weren't that great. Um, so eventually what happened is Microsoft hired this guy called Anders Halsberg. And he's essentially the guy who wrote Turbo Pascal, who wrote, who worked for Delphi. And he became the guy who did C Sharp for Microsoft. And since that point, you know, Microsoft have, have really had a wonderful set of development tools, C Sharp being in there. Um, and so that's, that's where we are in 2021. Um, but it definitely is a learning hill. You can see that curve and, and that also represents the, the kind of amount of learning that you've got to do um, around all of these new programming languages, libraries, platforms, and those sort of things. Okay, so that's programming languages. Joe, I don't know if we want to do some questions. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, f from my side, what, what springs to mind um, first is, uh, you know, is there a number of programming languages that that uh, you should know? Like, uh, th you've listed those four. Are there, are there more that you would recommend? So, so it depends. Um, you know, I think it's, I I'm going to talk a bit about this later on, but um, when I started, we were what I call... Uh, polyglots or generalists where, you know, you, you would know how to do, um, you know, a, a solution or a platform from start to finish um, in, in, you know, whatever language you needed to learn. Um, unfortunately, with this complexity, it's, it's actually no longer possible to be, um, you know, a, a high, a generalist with a high depth of knowledge. 
where we're kind of trending towards is the specialization. So, so in fact, these days where you want to be is you actually want to be more specialized in one or two things on one or two platforms and libraries um, rather than being a generalist. Um, Got you. So, for example, you'd kind of look at the job requirements. So we want a Python developer who knows how to deploy into serverless uh, environments on AWS and has knowledge in the finance industry. Sure, pretty narrow. Yeah, um, very but narrow. But that's kind of where the world's going. Um, no, that, that, that helps. Um, Colin, I see you have a question. Do you want to ask it? Um, you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and welcome, by the way? <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I don't know, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yeah. So I'm just curious, Jason, on your view of uh, things like teaching children to use Swift. Um, is that like barking up the wrong tree and should we be rather focusing on, on these others? Yeah, well, um, it's all about the intention, you know. So Swift, I think, is it has its place. Um, also amazing language, you know, in terms of the, the kind of Apple ecosystem. Um, but I, I, I think it's all about, you know, like, what is what is the outcome you're after? You know, are you after, um, you know, creating people with skills or, or allowing people to learn skills to such that they can become, you know, like a you know a, an iOS developer or a mobile developer, or are you are you offering kind of training that will help people to become uh, sort of enterprise developers? Um, so. Obviously, the, the market for the latter is bigger than the former, but it's absolutely a choice. If I may just add to that question, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, there's, there's things like uh, knowing how to code in or use the, the platforms like Power BI or, you know, the data management type of stuff and the infographic side of things. Um, is that also just a different specialization in your view uh, am i in the wrong forum basically or or I do no you think i think you know as well no so so with all of this you know programming and data analysis and data engineering and data science data visualization all of that they they tend to have a programming component to all of them um i think what it what it is though is just the depth of programming um, so, for example, um, so Power BI, Microsoft's sort of data visualization technology suite, um, is very, very useful. And you know, in terms of the roles uh, that that currently require it, you know, if you're a data um, analyst, definitely you would want to be using something like that. If you're a data scientist, you probably would as well. Um, combined with and uh, some some programming uh, kind of experience, um, because what Power BI re relies upon is data in a format that you can visualize it. And in order to do that, you might need to write some code to get the data to where it needs to be, which is the data engineering or ETL. You might need to clean the data because the quality, you know, people have been putting garbage in. So you might, as a data analyst, need to write some some code to do that. Um, so, so I do think um, it's like a Swiss Army knife programming uh, and fills the gap for a lot of these um, more kind of modern roles. That's a nice way of, of seeing programming, yeah. Because, I mean, for me, running a small business, um, I can always say there's a need. Like, there'll be a platform that says you can do it without coding, but you always need some level of custom coding and custom programming on the, you know, to, to do what you want. So, um, Jason, do you want to move on to the next one? Sure. Let me do that. Great. So, um, sort of moving on and, and kind of progressing from programming languages, I'd like to just talk about cloud and serverless. And so, um, you know, where we started is on the left-hand side in this world of what, what we call kind of bare metal or a, another like way of describing it that the infrastructure guys use is they call it tins. So what would we do? We would buy a tin or a very powerful machine 
and this is back in the 90s. It started in the 90s, I guess. And we would put a lot of storage and, and CPU in there, and we would run our applications on this thing, uh, you know, this bare metal or this, um, this tin. Um, but as we, as technologies improved, um, there was a technology um, called virtual machines that sort of uh, emerged and virtual machines have actually been with us since the 60s, but they've only, they only became popular sort of, I would think, in the late 90s. And, and all virtual machines allow you to do is to take that tin or that big machine, the bare metal, and run more on it. So you can carve it up into these little virtual machines, which are in, in themselves, um, you know, they're fully, you know, fully running Windows or Mac or, you know, um, Linux or whatever. Um, and they run on this bare metal. So we've carved up the bare metal into virtual machines. Um, and then around 2013, um, Docker came up with this concept of containers. And what containers are, are again, a, another way to carve up virtual machines into more efficient ways of using them. And so what containers are, it's almost analogous to container ships where you carve up the virtual machine resources, you know, the, um, you know, the storage and, and the processing power, and you run containers which are more lightweight, and so you can run more on a virtual machine. And so really all, all this journey has been so far from left to right is just, you know, using the bare metal, because all cloud is is a server running somewhere. It's just, you know, it might be in a different country. It might be sitting on a ship <laughs> moored somewhere cold, you know, because, you know, you don't need to air condition the, the machines. But, you know, cloud really is just a somebody server running somewhere that you're using to do some function. Um, and so where we are at this point um, is this concept of serverless. And so we, we're going from containers now, which essentially got, you know, carved up the virtual machines and what you would have in a container is your application plus the libraries it needed. Now, if we go to the right to functions, literally you just have your source code of your application running on a server somewhere in the world and giving you a result. And you literally just pay for that compute that you use. Um, so I guess it's a journey of, you know, it is, more complicated in, in some ways, but more efficient in others. Um, and so what we see in South Africa, uh, we see a lot of people still on bare metal. We see a lot of people in the cloud using, you know, AWS Lambda functions. You know, so as a developer going into the market, you actually need to understand from left to right of how, not only how to write your program, but how to get it to run in these various different ways. Um, and so with cloud, it's, I always call it this, this horse race, you know, um, what happens with all the providers is they have very similar offerings. And when a new offering arrives, the others adopt. Um, and so they keep the kind of feature set quite similar. Um, and so, you know, they all do very similar things. Um, what's really interesting that many people don't know is it is very easy to get free cloud services and servers from Azure, um, from Amazon Web Services, from Google Cloud Services. Um, all of them have this free tier that can be used and, and actually as a learning experience, very good to play around with that. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we are with cloud. Um, and so what this brings us though is a whole bunch of different jobs and different skill sets that are required. Because now you need people who understand, you need a, who understand how to configure the cloud to do the stuff you want to do. You need a, people who understand how to get the software that has been built into the cloud for use. Then you've got people who look at the cloud and see how it's performing and keep track of costs because costs can be quite uh, unpleasant if you don't watch them. Um, so just to tell a story, we, we got a, a sponsorship from AWS um, at Coding Ground. And uh, it was lovely, and we did all sorts of great stuff uh, using a technology called Kubernetes. 
and we left our cluster running and we forgot about it. And then one month I got an incredibly large bill on the card and fell off my chair. <laughs> um, needless to say, I very quickly switched all of that off. But, um, you know, cloud is wonderful, but you've got to keep a good handle on the costs because the costs can get super expensive. Sure, that, that almost seems a little bit sneaky on, on AWS's side. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, one of, one of our clients um, was spending sort of hundreds of thousands of rands on cloud services just because it had got out of hand. It, 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 you know, people weren't monitoring it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's very easy for that to happen, you know. So uh, there, there are jobs just in that, in cloud optimization and helping people to kind of manage their costs and, and keep things in, in check. No, great. I want to open it up to... Um, uh, yeah, to the floor, basically. Um, does anyone have any questions about, I mean, especially from you guys, the learners, you know, cloud, do you have any questions about it? This is your chance. Anything. There's no stupid question. Clemile, go ahead. Um, is cloud a multi-platform? Like, does it have many, many like a lot of things you can do with it or is it more specific? I think um, to answer that, I, I think there's pretty much, when, when we talk about platforms, we can mean different things. Um, so in general, um, the cloud uh, providers support very common and, and the, the most uh, popular platforms. So for example, um, you might be running PHP, they support that, and maybe even Laravel. Uh, for example, if you're using uh, Kubernetes, there's Kubernetes offerings. Um, so the cloud uh, providers typically support many, many platforms, uh, many, many kind of di you know, different types of kind of languages and, and, and software. Does that answer your question, Camille? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I guess the programmers are there for anything that the cloud doesn't support. You can program it to then be able to support. You know, that's that's yeah. the that's the beauty of of software development. Um, any other questions on cloud, guys? I, I mean, the thing that I'm taking away from this is that. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for Techway specifically, Jason, you and I need to chat about how we can um, integrate more like cloud-based skills into our into our pathways because it you know it doesn't help just having all the programming languages. You actually need to start um, getting a sense of of how cloud integrates with that. Um, so yeah. that will be an offline conversation. Yeah. But any other questions, guys? I see there's some in the chat. Um, no worries, Rachel. Thanks for joining. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one, which is the super exciting one. Great. So um, it, I'd like to just talk about storage here. So, and, and I think it's more broadly around sort of data and data generation. So as humankind, we are producing a massive amount of data just through our daily lives. Um, and I was looking at Scientific American, and they're saying by 2025, which is only a handful of years away, 33 zettabytes of data will have been generated. Now, 33, 3.3 and 22 zeros, that is a lot of data. And, you know, for me, it makes a lot of sense, because if you think about the exponential complexity and size um, that's a big driver. Um, fortunately, our storage technologies are getting better and better. And where we're at now is we're, there are a lot of companies, uh, Microsoft is one of them, and there are others looking into DNA storage. And what DNA storage is really um, encoding data, the ones and zeros in, in DNA. Um, and the density of storage is incredibly um, uh, dense, I guess. And so where we kind of at is we're saying that the sum total of all human knowledge will be able to be stored 
on a device the size of a ping pong ball. So imagine uh, your phone and your phone would be a device like that and simply have all human knowledge stored on it. I mean, it's quite mind blowing. Playing this forward though, for, for those of you who like uh, kind of Star Trek, um, what this also means is that we will be able to store everything about our body. We'll be able to encode our bodies uh, and the data around every cell um, and possibly even sort of, you know, beam ourselves around the universe and, you know, maybe print ourselves out at some destination with some uh, high-speed uh, printing technology. Um, so it's it's a really interesting world, and, and things are moving at a at a massive rate. I think that what's happening here is the the need or the demand for more storage is driving this innovation and clever ways of doing things. Um, so yeah, super exciting from that perspective. Um, yeah, just you know, just playing it back. You know, only sort of yeah two decades. I mean, we were excited with DVDs. And DVDs were, wow, geez, look at that. We can watch a whole movie in, in, in reasonably good quality. Um, going from there to every bit of human knowledge in a device in the palm of your hands, uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, this the, this one for me is quite quite a mind blower. Um, but yeah, I, I see Colin on the chat added. I don't know if any of you guys have watched the the Netflix series called Altered Carbon. Uh, Colin, I have. Yeah. I loved it. Um, and exactly, <laughs> exactly that. So basically, Jason, you're saying that it is something you think that that might be feasible. But the scary thing for me is that. You know, if 3.3 zettabytes is what we're going to have by 2025, you know, I, I mean, this uh, by within a year, that number will be sky high, more exponential growth, more. I mean, this the like level of data that is getting generated is just mind blowing, um, and clearly, storage is already ahead of the curve. Like uh, our ability to to store that data is already ahead of of or almost ahead of what we need. Is, is Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I mean, it's all still in development. So, I mean, this is not uh, available sort of mainstream, but it will, it will become available, you know. Um, yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a journey. And I, I do think that it'll, it'll become just part of your standard uh, setup, you know. So, uh, we probably won't even notice the difference. All that will happen is when we buy a computer or a phone, It'll just have tons of storage and we won't really, you know, notice the difference. It'll just be using this amazing uh, technology. Uh, but for us, we'll probably pretty much carry on as usual. Just have a lot more photos and videos, yeah, of those, those silly well, dogs and those cats <laughs> and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, but, well, uh, you'll have a copy of the internet just sitting, you know, and you'll just be like, well, let's go back to a copy of the internet as it was in 2021. Wow. Let's have a look at that. Oh, let's play it forward. Okay, let's go to a copy of the internet in 2024. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of where it'll be at. Yeah, crazy. Um, so let me open it to the floor and see if you guys have got any questions. I'm not expecting anyone to understand the technology behind DNA storage, because that's going to be like crazy, like futuristic stuff. But, you know, do you have any questions about what kind of skills you need for for this trend that is uh, very much on, on our doorstep? Anyone? So it's interesting here, if I can just interject, is um, with all this data, what and you know what will we do with it? How will we process it? How will we apply um, kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence to this amount of data? And again, I, I think there's a whole uh, generation of new skills and jobs um, of people who understand how to navigate this quantum of data and make sense of it. I mean, it does feel, 
because the next feature skills session that we're doing next month is with a genetic consultant um, where we, we look, it's essentially taking health sciences and data science and looking at what, what essentially what healthcare will look like in the future. Um, and I mean, it just feels like data science is such a core skill kind of sector to go into um, for, you know, any industry, it's going to be a hugely in demand. Um, I, I don't know if there's any specific skills that you think around the, the actual storage, um, like kind of hardware yeah. piece that, that you think people uh, need to explore if they're wanting to go and um, hit this trend? Yeah, so I'm not sure about the hardware, but what I can say is the data engineers um, that we have today and the skills they have around manipulating and moving data, I think that there's a whole another generation around the, the DNA data engineers. And um, yeah, because that's the level of skill in, in kind of being able to manipulate this, this data will be uh, much higher. I mean, what, what also is happening in the world is um, machine learning and AI is becoming commoditized. Uh, so if I go back to 2017, we did our first uh, machine learning project at RMB and I hired a, a team of mathematicians. But these days, um, what has happened is um, some smart people in Silicon Valley have said, well, we've hired the best data scientists in the world and we've got them to write models now all you do is just bring your data and we'll tell you what mm. the models are to solve your problem. So, right. so there's a lot of that sort of platform. So you might end up being someone working for a platform, you know, so this is again, another a whole new world of potential jobs where you're a platform developer working on, you know, machine uh, learning, uh, operating on DNA storage. That sounds cool. I see, I see Hrumila, you got another question. Lovely to hear from you. Oh, um, I just wanted to ask if DNA storage has any similarities to people separating DNA from any living physical thing? Yeah, so, so um, what it is, it, it really is just about using the, the normal um, encoding of DNA and influencing the encoding such that your, your zeros and ones, your bits and bytes, your data gets encoded in the strands. Now, exactly how they do that, I think um, you probably need to just have a look at, um, but it's, um, it's using that, that technology. And what's really interesting about um, this type of storage compared to normal storage is if you think about like a flash disk or a hard drive um, or, or even a memory chip, um, they are not using kind of uh, 3D structures or as efficiently as, as they can. And because DNA uh, of its sort of makeup and its uh, physical characteristics in terms of how, it, how the strand can be kind of pulled together, the density is much higher than, than what you can do in traditional methods. So it's essentially, uh, my understanding of it is how our bodies store data, like how the DNA works is, is what this technology ha is piggybacking on. They're kind of copying how DNA works in living organization, organisms to then, you know, replicate that into a, like a storage device. Um, Munya has got a question here, or do you think that data science is a good career to go into? Well, Munya, I just said I thought it was, was but it does depend on um, on what you like. It's not for everyone. It's uh, I, I would suggest um, if you are a learner that you go, go and check out the, the TechWiz um, data science path to get a sense of what it is and whether you like it or not. Um, Jason, let me pass that question over to you as well and get get your response on data science as a career choice. Um, so if you asked me in 2017, did I think um, did I think it was a good career? I would say yes. Um, I think these days with the events of these platforms, I think you need a base knowledge of, of data science, but the platforms are doing so much 
there isn't uh, much opportunity for custom models anymore. So I do think you need a base level of knowledge, but then after that, I think you need to learn how to use the data robots, um, the, the Azure's of the world and others, because that's kind of where it's going. Um, because so how this so you will work is a basic understanding you know, of the platform of data and how it works, but then you actually need to start specialising in some of the platforms available that work with data. Precisely, yes. Because um, you know, if you if you're trying to code models by hand, you're going up against the smartest people in the planet, um, which you may not win at. So a better strategy is more just to understand the basics and then then specialize on the platforms where you've got those people, um, you know, you're writing the algorithms, but you get to solve the problem for your, the company that you work for. Cool. Um, I see that our time is officially up, but I do want to open it up to any other questions. Um, actually, before I open up to questions, the last thing that I want to ask you, Jason, is just, you know, if you sort of had to summarize what you think would be for, for okay look at that <laughs> you've even got a slide on it, there it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. no so like, the, um yeah i mean I, I think um so when it comes to programming um it's all about specialization it keys into what we're talking about now because not only do you need to know the language you need to know the la the library ecosystem the platform the cloud provider and then also even the business domain so you've got to specialize in a space. You've got to have cloud skills, otherwise you won't be able to do the job um, because everybody's on cloud at some, you know, to some extent. Um, and you, the other thing which is a bit harder is this unlearning and learning new things. Things are moving at a, at a massive rate. And, you know, what I find particularly difficult is the unlearning, um, the unlearning hmm. of hard things and, the ways, the ways we used to do it, well, we don't do that anymore. You need to unlearn that and relearn different things. Um, but I think one of the, the other areas that, that really is um, very powerful for, for people wanting to get into this space is get involved with open source software because you're going to work with some really smart people who will teach you stuff um, as well as you will build a portfolio of, this, of the things that you've done. So by the time you get to a point where you're looking for a job, um, not only have you had training from some, some pretty skilled people, but you've also got some evidence. Well, that's, that's amazing um, piece of advice. Yeah, I think what, what, what we'll start doing is sharing some of those open source communities um, so that our learners can actually dip into them uh, if, they're so, if they feel like they have the skills and want to yeah create those amazing things so some some of the stuff that the kids are creating is just phenomenal so i have total faith that um that will happen so thank you everyone uh it's a little bit late that i'm ending i hope i'm not keeping you from dinner um but it was really really lovely to to have you online we, we didn't have all the people that we that at RSVP, but I will be sending for any of any of you who've got colleagues who didn't make it, etc. Um, I'll be sending you guys an email tomorrow just with uh, the recording. So if you want to look at it again or send it to your your mates, that you can do that. But lovely having everyone. And Jason, thank you so much for your insights. It was mind blowing. The last one. I can't wait to be able to go travel. You know, like be, beam me to Asia somewhere, and I can, you know, <laughs> without the airfare and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.